so we will call the meeting to order at 604. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? All right, hearing none. Approve the minutes of January 3rd. So move. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the minutes? All right, hearing none, the minutes of January 3rd are passed. Do we have any correspondence or communications, which we did, we, did, we, we don't have anything. So we're good. Any public comments? Do we have anybody on tonight? I couldn't see who's in the room with you, Jamie. We do not. Okay, all right. And reports to the board. Jamie, you're up. Uh, so good evening. Um, I've been uh, trying to keep uh, the board updated in uh, some written memos via email in regards to the changes that have been happening over the last few weeks in regards to um, the education fund uh, and the ramifications of the implementation of Act 127 and how that has impacted the um, the education fund and specifically the yield. And so, and I know that um, many of you have been uh, following this closely through information provided to us uh, via the v VSBA and or <laughs> provided via the media and or um, some of our local reps have put some information out um, via some of your local towns. <laughs> Um, communication uh, mechanisms, whether that's listservs, front porch forums, things of that nature. Uh, I have, uh, last week, I spent time with the VSA. I was invited to join the uh, Vermont Superintendents Association uh, trustees um, to discuss um, Act 127. And uh, that invitation was extended to me from the um, Vermont's uh, business officers, President um, Vasbo, uh, the VSA uh, executive director, the VSA uh, president, and then also um, Sue joined from the VSBA. Uh, what it became clear to me is that um, something that I would, I would say that I think we've been doing a good job of discussing as a board since back in September around significant concerns around the implementation of Act 127 and how that may result in a, a really significant reduction in the yield. Uh, of which, you know, by most reports is, is that, you know, well over 70% of districts now are over the 5% tax cap. Um, we actually have two districts right now that are under still. Um, and what it is important to know is that we had all but one district under until the latest drop in the yield, uh, which then did kick over two additional districts into the 5% cap. Actually, to the point where districts were looking at the, uh, you know, 23rd hour of having to cut to, you know, a quarter of a million dollars to even get under the cap before then they could start to have any impact on the tax rate. Just so uh, the board members know, that last drop in the yield was the equivalent of four cents in all of our districts. Um, so it was pretty significant that came out in January. Uh, my my <laughs> worry still remains that that may not have even been the last drop in the yield. My sense is by the time we get to May, that we could see an even uh, greater decrease to the yield. And so I share that with you for two reasons. Uh, one, boards that are already under the ceiling and within the 5% cap, when I send out informa information now talking about a drop in the yield, it is important that you understand that that does, that now that you're within the 5% cap, unless anything is changed currently in law, that will not have an effect on your tax rate. For districts that are under the cap, as that yield continues to drop, it will impact our tax rate in those districts. Um, so that's important to, to know. The other thing that I would say um, in regards to my meetings last week is that I have been told 
that there have been uh, research done by the tax department that, you know, that the Ed Fund will be, um, be funded uh, via their one mechanism right now to generate increased revenue, which is the only mechanism they really have. The leather they the lever they can use is the yield. Okay, so they have they've already figured out in regards to the the revenue streams that they bring in. An example: the lottery is the revenue stream that they bring into the Ed Fund, right? Like beyond that, the mechanism they have currently, unless they change statute is to drop the yield to increased funds. Uh, and they have supposedly run data to show that if they were to drop the yield to a level to fund the Ed Fund, that it could potentially put everyone over the 5% cap. Um, that's yet to be determined, right? They're looking to figure out what actual school district budgets have been approved at. And my sense is they'll continue to run that data now between now and town meeting based on approved budgets. Um, and then uh, certainly they're going to continue to follow districts that vote a little later. For example, we have two districts that don't vote until May. Um, and so, Jamie, what does this all mean? What, what I would say is it what it means is is that you know I'm really in a camp, and I've I've talked to the VSA of it is very very late in this budget season to now start changing the law. Yeah. yeah. All right. And so. To, to go around changing Act 127 and who goes in front of committees, even if they, you know, we have a districts that have worked hard to stay under that 10% threshold. We had a district that was over the 10% ceiling who worked to make cuts to get under the 10% ceiling to ensure that they were able to utilize um, the provisions of Act 127 within the cap. The notion that that rule would then all of a sudden change to now that that district board is now going in front of some type of review committee and or other districts who are under the cap that the yield then put them over the cap, I am completely opposed to, just to be clear. But that is that has been my sentiment, that to change the game at the 23rd hour and say that the goal line post moves this year when district boards have approved their budgets, I do not believe is fair. Um, what I would say, though, is that 127, the other piece to this, though, is that the legislature needs to work on this, that a, a, as in current law, I, I believe it needs to be changed moving forward. I think that, that we have um, an issue in regards to uh, how we're going to move forward of funding the Ed Fund um, over the next five years uh, if we don't address it moving forward. OK, I don't think, though, doing anything um, that would upheave what districts believe the rules were in regards to their budgeting process now, I, I, that I'm not in favor of. I think we need to look at what are we going to do moving forward. The other uh, thing that I would just say to you is, is that, and, and I shared this as a concern, is that once again, I believe the tax department had a really good sense that CLAs had tanked to the level that they have across the state back on the December 1 tax letter when there was notions of 17 and a half to 18 and a half percent increases in taxes. If you look at the driving force across our supervisory union in regards to the tax bill, the drop in the CLAs are the, are the huge chunk to that, even with this drop in yield. And most of our districts, even with the cap, we're looking at about a six cent increase and then the CLA is doing the rest of the increase past that. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I hear a lot of talk about Act 127 and what districts are doing in regards to spending, if they're under the ceiling and all these other different things. But I also think the legislature really needs to look at the common level of appraisal. How do we get on a regular cycle and how do we try to, to you know, address that mechanism. There's been talk in the past around the legislature about how to try to get folks on a regular cycle around the common level of appraisal so that we don't see such huge uh, discrepancies of changes year over year. And I'll just say, you know, my final thing that I get really frustrated is, is that there's a lot of talk about education taxes going up 18 and a half, 20%, but that's never said 
with the caveat that the CLA may be actually contributing, you know, 70% of that increase of 18.5%. Um, and instead, there's a lot of talk about what, you know, school boards or superintendents are doing to try to better cap spending. So those are all my thoughts in regards to where we're at right now. Um, I don't know. So things that we have that we're, we've changed up for this coming year is, as uh, we've got a question and answer sheet that I that was much like what we used during our COVID days. I think it was a uh, good tool that we use that folks could submit questions and then we would do our best to address them and answer them. I think that I really would like to try to have our constituents across our multiple districts see that, you know, that m most of us have res have ended up in the same place base to a lot of factors that are out of our control, like drop in yield, decrease in CLA. We'll also show them what some of our neighboring supervisory union and districts are doing in regards to those tax rates as we lead up to our votes and in our information set uh, sessions. Um, the other thing we're doing this year is that we've created a opportunity for folks to link to a video that we're going to produce that's specific to talking about Act 127 and the impacts on the tax sheet to try to help folks understand what does it even mean to have a ceiling and cap, that folks can access that. Uh, we're gonna look to um, our high school to post a weekly um, radio show uh, with Royalton uh, Public Radio. We're gonna try to get a podcast a couple of different times to just keep folks abreast about um, the mechanism of the 127 and what might be happening in the legislature moving up to our annual meetings. Um, and certainly we'll be working with boards to change what our presentation would look like um, to try to better highlight uh, for folks all the different um, kind of moving mechanisms that have occurred here um, in the last um, really three months. Of uh, which some they're very accustomed to, like the CLA. That is not a that that is a term they've heard us talk about on a regular basis over time. I just think really helping folks um, dial into what that how that actually impacts the bottom line in regards to the tax bill is something we really need to help folks um, with. There was a animated uh, thing that. Somebody put out that explains the school budget. It's online; you can find it. But it, yeah, it's, it's actually does it pretty good. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever. I've seen asked it. them to update one now with Act One Twenty Seven that we right. could all utilize, and I have not heard whether or not that's actually going to happen or not. Right. Because the one I've seen is old. it's prior, yeah. but it does do explain CLA and yield somewhat. You know. So right now, without um, receiving any necessarily support from some of our, you know, our organizations. I'm gonna to try to see if we can duplicate something similar to that. I agree with you, Rodney. It was pretty It was pretty handy and made it simple to understand. Right. All right, um, Eric. So uh, the first thing that I will say is uh, thank you, Jamie, and the rest of the administration, both at where you're sitting now and at the, uh, uh, you know, the different schools um, for all the work that has uh, gone into both the budgeting season and, and helping us and others to understand what's going on, because I, I appreciate and understand how much work it is and how confusing it is. So uh, thank you for uh, for the work that, that you folks are are doing. The second thing that I will say is the one thing that I did not hear in your recitation of uh, uh, woes um, th that is, I think, important for our policy um, uh, makers to keep in mind um, is that there are a number of costs that we are incurring that we can't avoid, either because there are rises in healthcare costs that are part of the um, the, the way in which we treat our employees in, in a, a, a reasonable way, or there have been cost increases um, for salaries that are either pursuant to contracts or because we need to pay a living wage, 
um, th that are not um, indicative of padded um, or bloated budgets. They are indicative of us having to conduct business in this inflationary times. You know, thank you, Eric. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, that those points need to be continue to be made as well. Yes. Right. Anybody have anything else for Jamie's report? Jamie is Michael. Um, could you perhaps um, or not speak to the way that I'm starting to hear folks characterize uh, boards if they should choose to stay under the 10% but take advantage of some additional uh, revenue? Because that's that's being portrayed as I've heard it. I, the term I've heard, I, I've actually, I, it was said in a public meeting that that is slimy. Right. Uh, and so uh, what I would say to you is that I have pushed back uh, significantly on that. Uh, and we do have two districts have, who have done what you just said, that they have asked that did, Michael. to deal with deferred maintenance. They were two districts that were under the cap prior to the, the drop in the yield. They're districts that have struggled to put money away in previous years to fund um, capital improvements, of which many other districts in this state have done year after year. And those funds have come from the Ed Fund annually. Um, you know, I, th I think to say that there are certain ways that people are budgeting and that those are looked upon as okay via Act 127, and that there's other ways that folks are budgeting, that they may be putting some funds away to deal with deferred maintenance because they haven't been able to. I don't think it is fair to characterize what is okay in regards to a district decision around budgeting and what isn't. The other thing I would say to you is, is that there are many districts, and we're going to be getting ready to go into negotiations next year, who have settled recently on teacher contracts, right? And that that those additional spending are also part of their budgets in regards to whether or not they're under the ceiling. And frankly, having some funds in our budgets too that will help us in regards to offsetting that in years to come, strategic budgeting that way, I would hope would be looked at as, boy, boards are looking and thinking ahead. And so, you know, Michael, I have apologized to no one based on those two district boards decisions. I think you guys had all the information. The other part that, again, I would come back to, I think is an incredible flaw in regards to Act 127. It is in both situations, those districts would have to cut several teaching positions to even make an impact on the tax rate because they would have to get out from under the cap and frankly, the CLAs have dropped so much prior that it, it really made no sense for them in regards to representing your constituents. Um, and so, uh, Michael, what I would say to you is that we have two districts that did do that in this supervisory union. And I certainly know of other districts who also did the same thing. Uh, and I would say that in general, most of those districts are districts who have been struggling to deal with deferred maintenance, there's been all nothing done with via the legislature to help school districts be able to deal with deferred maintenance because there's been no funds since 2007 for school construction, right? And so if there's a mechanism here to help with things like pre-K buildings that were used when we bought them and should have been taken care of eight years ago. I don't think there's any reason for anyone to have to apologize for that. So Michael, thanks for asking the question. That's been my stance and that's how I've been uh, defending the boards within this SU's decisions. So I know Sarah's got her hand up, so I wanna uh, turn it over to her, but Jamie, if, if, if those two districts could get together with you and work on some language to uh, represent that stance, I think that would be helpful. Yep, that makes sense. Thanks. Sarah? Jamie, do you know anybody who from our district who or any anybody anywhere who's testifying uh, Thursday at, for the, the that uh, joint committee meeting? I don't know anyone who is testifying from RSU. I've been invited uh, multiple times to testify. And, 
you know, frankly, I would say to the board, I am not feeling uh, necessarily on Thursday that testifying made the best sense for us in regards to um, feeling like I was going into a, uh, a playing field where there weren't some folks who are worried to um, have the result be such that a sound bite could be gained by this and or who already had their minds made up in regards to how they felt like this needed to play out. I, so I did not think it was uh, made sense for us in regards to strategy and or feeling like I was being received it with an open mind necessarily that it made sense. I was really worried about some folks feeling really negatively about the thing that Michael just asked and it wouldn't matter how that was described that that was going to be seen as negative. And again, I say that just based on that, you know, I've heard I've heard the word gaming, I've heard the word tax loopholes and I I've heard the notion of slimy being used. Andrew, so just a sec before I, I just said one other follow up on that and then um is that I yesterday I got on a roll. <laughs> I wrote letters to all sorts of people, and one of the letters that I wrote to, uh, one of the people I wrote to was to the author of the Vermont Digger um, article that where uh, some of the quotes came from that we were gaming the system and everything, and, and asked him and volunteered that if he wanted a school board perspective, that here was my phone number and he could give me a call and I'd be more than willing to talk to him. I also wrote a letter to Sue from the VSBA, and... Um, I, I got to admit that letter that we got through or that I think board chairs got, but it was also in the Digger um, uh, article uh, angered me and offended me. Um, and so, and I, it really angered me that it came from an organization that's supposed to be advocates for us. And I let her know that. And um, she came back and basically said, well, we didn't agree with it. We didn't write it. So we didn't really, have anything to do with it, but you sent it out to us and um, that um, really uh, angered me. I also thanked Rebecca Holcomb for her uh, letter to our listserv, and I think it went into some other towns um, um, to really just basically say that school boards were not to blame in this. And um, she's coming to our board meeting on the 6th of February um, to talk with us about it because the impacts are huge. The impacts are even huger in Norwich. I heard they have like a 36% increase from her uh, in their budget. And um, I used to bargain the Dresden contract and Norwich always had a really hard time coming up with it because they, um, you know, they, they partnered with Hanover's tax base to, to come up with it in it. So, I mean, it's, it's, um, we're in, I don't know. I just was angered and, decided I was going to write letters yesterday. <laughs> Good for you, Sarah. <laughs> Andrew? Um, so speaking as a district that's in the opposite situation where we are under the cap and now, you know, the we're hoping that the yield doesn't go up. And so um, I certainly know would be taking advantage of the same thing you guys did. Like when we had Act 46 and we did our merger, we we did that. We took advantage of our tax cap to add some extra spending. But um, Jamie, I'm curious when you speak to representatives or whoever about what the fix should be, what are you saying? Because, you know, it seems to me that there's a pretty simple fix to this. And if they could get it done quickly, like we could take that into account and it would kind of solve the issue and that the reason that they have the cap is that they didn't want towns that were adversely impacted by these weighting changes to have the full impact. And the way to do that would just be to cap the ratio of the equalized pupil to the yield and how that changed for each district. That doesn't change like how people are spending. It just changes the impact of Act 127 on the individual districts and makes it so that it can't go up by too much in one year. So, you know, uh, thank you, Andrew. You mentioned that to me last week, and I did start to discuss that uh, more specifically with the VSA because I think it's important that they have a talking point around how we might solve this. And I would say I started to get some interest there, Andrew. Um, and so I think we're going to need to help walk them through that some more. 
I think, you know, the, the thing that I think in general our legislature struggles with is that it is everyone wrapping their head around the complexities of actually how we get to that tax rate, right? And so helping those folks understand that notion and or helping the advisors with the joint fiscal offices understand that I think could be really helpful. Um, because I, I would say the heart of Act 127, I am completely in support of. The problem was, is that um, there was a lot of time spent on the pupil waiting piece and not enough time spent on what we're talking about right now, where the rubber meets the road around how it may actually impact the Ed Fund and then also, you know, budgets and tax rates. And so, Andrew, I would actually be interested in talking to you further about that myself, because I do think the VSA is looking for a solid solution. And you you ran that by me last week and I did share that. I think there could possibly be some interest there. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it would have to be done very soon before people are passing budgets based. Well, I don't, I'm talking about not necessarily for this year. I'm talking about, right, I don't, sure. yeah, like moving forward. Because I don't think they have a good sense of how to, to change it moving forward where, it, where we could still get to the heart of the law, right? But we're not back in this type of scenario. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess the other thing I would say is I hope you're – speaking up strongly in favor of not raising the yield to like, I mean, there's, if there's 30% of districts that are still under the 5% cap, like raising the yield just makes it so that they're generating all the money from those 30% districts. lowering. Oh yeah, no, I totally. And I, and that's Which what, is, and, and I've gone as far Andrew to say, look at an example of districts who have worked incredibly hard to be under the cap of which first Branson and Sharon were. And when you drop the yield further, you just put them way over, not even over a little bit. You put them over in a situation where they couldn't get back out from under it or over it. And so I, I shared to them, you're perpetuating this problem by doing that. So yes, I have certainly advocated for that. And I've said that right. if you're concerned, maybe you need to look at a different lever right now to bring in funding for the Ed Fund. Yeah, and the more that you keep raising that lever, the less effective it is because the more towns are in the cap. So, Michael, did you have something else? Yeah, I'm. I'm just curious um, to know who's on the phone on Ensign One Nine. It's a board member. Okay, great. I'm Neil from G Hut. Great. All right. Anything else for Jamie, guys? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Siobhan Neal from Granville. Thank you. No problem. How do I remute? Okay. Star six. All right. You had a question, Kathy. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think Jamie's spot on. Um, we've got a tremendous challenge. Um, you know, I'm an optimist and if any organization and leadership team can overcome this challenge and the headwinds we're facing um, regarding how personally perturbed we are with, with this, uh, we can do it. That's my first thing. The second thing is I like the idea of really teaming together on how to present the reality to our constituents so they understand the building blocks of why this is happening and what we can control and not control. And I think that's well worth the effort. Um, people just won't believe. I know and in, in, in our said that um, the CLA is impacting Rochester by over a third and stock price by approximately two thirds. I mean, holy moly, that is. So that's a that's the thing that seems like we're, we're well on our way to, to solve that. The second thing is that I looked at income sensitivity and that is up gigantically um, as well as for those um, one third of our property owners that pay their school tax by their property value. That said, 
the my analysis shows that in, in many, 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 many cases, even with that large increase with the income sensitivity um, tax, they're going to be paying substantially less than their neighbors that are paying by the value of their property. And I think we need to be aware of that and we'd be able to explain that to our constituents. We're not saying excuses. We're not saying, oh, it's, this isn't tough. But the fact is, under our state law, we've got two ways of paying school taxes. And even with this increase, uh, those paying basically make $100,000 or less are going to be paying less. And I think we should be able to explain that to help soften the, the blow. The other thing, and I'd say too much time, is that this is a time we've got to be able to tell the taxpayers, what are you getting for your value? Their yes. hair, their fire, everything else. What are you getting? And this is where we've got to be very articulate of the progress, the advance, the advantages, the benefits of what the SU and the individual districts are doing for their kids. And we've got to be very articulate about that and say, we don't want to lose that. That's too valuable here. You're looking at the cause. Don't take it out on the kids. But I think we need to be very, very articulate on the five or 10 points on that and, and drive that home the best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. All right, guys, anything else for Jamie? Okay, so Onda, you're up next. And after Onda's done, I think, Sarah, will you take over for me? I'm gonna scoot. I have people waiting for me for dinner. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> if that's okay with you, Miss Sarah. Right. So on the screen, screen. Yes, but my muted. Yes, it's okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess the most, and this feels like a kind of a big shift in this in the conversation. So I'll just say uh, I'm extremely grateful to work with a superintendent and a board that can handle all this as hard as it is so that I can do my job, which is focus on teaching and learning, which we are still doing every day, despite all of these, all of these distractions. Um, you have the report. We're doing a lot with professional development right now. I almost think of, and you all will probably relate to this, that right at this point in time, we're we're straddling three years at the same time. So when we're looking at sort of academic data right now, we've got our winter benchmark that came in as we meet with teachers and we meet with buildings and data teams. We're looking at sort of the growth over the past years. We're looking at like school year 22, 23. How did our students do then? How have they grown since then? And we're starting to make plans. Um, we're certainly very much in the middle of this year thinking about how much growth our students have made. Where do we have more work to do? What sort of, what ways can we use the instructional time that we have? Um, to really continue to fill gaps and accelerate growth um, and deepen learning for all of our students. Uh, and then we're also, as you all know, with the budgets, we're pivoting towards looking at next year. So we're starting to look at the SUY calendar. We do that in, in collaboration with the neighboring SUs so that our students um, who are in you know, the technical career center have you know, a, a consistent schedule. Um, and our buildings are starting to look at their master schedules and say, you know, where do we need to make some adjustments? Do we have, uh, you know, an ELA um, program that needs a little bit more time here? How do we adjust that schedule? So all of those things sort of are going on at, at once and think in terms of thinking about sort of this, this kind of three year arc and both trying to stay in the moment, but also look back and, and look ahead at the same time. So feels like a busy time of year. <laughs> Happy to take any questions. <clears throat> I've got one uh, PLC. Mm. It means so many things. Which one? <laughs> um, uh, you, you refer to that. Yes. And, okay. Uh, there. And, yep. and I'm, I, I thought it was personalized learning classrooms or something like that, but I'm not sure I've got it right. PLP, you know, personalized capstone projects. But what's so? Uh, what, what's what do we got here in PLC? Just so we this? we probably use that acronym in two different ways most consistently. You are correct. Yeah, One of them yeah. is the personalized learning classroom, yeah. which we have it um, yeah. in the high school, uh, really about meeting the, those individual students' needs. Uh, in this, in the where you're seeing it here yes. in, in goal two, and how you'll yeah. often hear about in education is professional learning community. Ah. And it's when we have educators coming together. So in this case, right, all of our PE teachers are coming together. Are thinking about right they're kind of by themselves in their individual schools or districts um and this is a real opportunity for them to share so we do yes thank you for uh, making me always unpack those uh, acronyms 
I'll figure it out sooner or later. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> trivia. I'm a member of the PLC, which is the Professional Loggers. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right, guys, I'm going to turn this over to Sarah. I really appreciate you, but everybody here is waiting for me to leave. So I should Thanks, probably Kathy. go do my due diligence. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good dinner. Thank you. Any other questions for Anda? <laughs> Hearing none. Thanks, Anda. Mm -hmm. Moving along to Director of Special Services, Annette. Hi. All right. You also have a, a copy of my report. And um, yes, looking at some data over over time, um, we submitted our December child counts due the beginning uh, beginning of December every every year. Um, so the first graph just gives you an idea of what our child count numbers are and have been over time. Um, Again, there's not much fluctuation you know, within within those numbers, and, and some of that's out of our control. Uh, we had a large number um, of students move in this fall um, that came already supported by IEP plans and um, special education. Um, so, in a way, I, I mean, I th take that as a as a great thing that families are feeling. We're providing wonderful education and have wonderful supports for you know their their children that they feel comfortable moving into our town. So I actually take that as a compliment and and welcome families moving in. Um, the next one I just broke it down by district. This was a question that I got last year around this time was like thank you for the greater SU numbers, but what does it look like for each of the um, districts? So. The next graph just breaks it down by what I had for data um, for the past two years. Um, again, some districts uh, numbers are, are going down slightly. Some are staying about the same. The next graph I think is is more is most important and um, really speaks to um, the work that we're doing with our system um, of supports that we are offering. Uh, within our districts, the initial special education evaluations um, is down by almost 50%. Um, and really what, what that's telling us is that we're catching students earlier, um, that we're able to support them and give them proper interventions earlier, and we're not waiting for them to kind of hit a mark to fail or get to a certain point um, where that they need special education. Um, so I think that really just speaks to um, what we are offering within our systems um, of support and all of the professional development that we've been providing um, our professionals and support staff uh, to be able to provide a proper research-based intervention um, to all of our students with fidelity. So I think that graph is just a really important uh, data point for us. Um, and then I just included um, the, our top two kind of um, disability categories within our supervisory union, just so that everyone can kind of see how they've been flexing over time. And I just wanted to highlight that um, the yellow is, is our emotional disturbance uh, category. And it's on a trend, um, on a downward trend which again, I think speaks to our early intervention and the work that we're doing with our designated mental health agencies and professionals here in our area. Um, so we're really able to meet the needs of our students, um, again, quickly, efficiently, and um, in a timely manner. And the last two graphs just kind of speak to, um, the first one is about um, students accessing our alternative classrooms or our personal learning classroom, the PLC at the high school. Um, again, those numbers at the elementary and middle school are going down. Um, at the high school, as you can see, the graph grew um, this year, but we were able to do that because we were able to kind of open up uh, the, the depth and breadth of the services that we're able to um, provide students and actually bring in uh, students with much broader disability categories and help support them uh, within that system. So that's why that number went up. 
Um, and then the next graph just talks about the number of students um, that are attending out of district educational placements. Uh, so that's not school choice, that's us um, placing them in a more of a therapeutic um, alternative school setting um, outside of their public school. Um, and again, those numbers have decreased significantly um, over time. And I gave you a projected number um, also for next year, which is down slightly from this year. So any questions? <coughs> yes. Sarah, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't see. Yes. <laughs> a um, couple of questions, and this is really important. So I've got four or five questions, if you don't mind. And Sarah, cut me off if I'm <laughs> blathering or just monopolizing this. But I don't have important. the mute button. I'm not so, afraid to do that for you. Uh, so important. I guess the first question is, you have the child count. Mm -hmm. Uh, some by year, and then we got the rest of the graphs. Yeah. Is the first graph, the child count, is the only graph that includes the choice kid, kids in choice schools, or do all these graphs have to be interpreted by, other than some are very clear within our SU? Um, sure. So, so the, explain. the full child count is, is everyone that lives here in our supervisory union towns. Yep. The next one, the child count by school district is, okay. is everyone that lives in that town, whether they attend you know, our high school or high school somewhere else. Uh, the initial evaluations, that's just within our supervisory yeah. union. So yeah. those are our students attending our buildings. Um, the specific learning disability and emotional disability, that is everyone that lives within our supervisory okay. union. So that, that in our towns, so they could attend school somewhere else via school choice. And then the last two, those are students that are here within our um, supervisory union schools. Thank you. Yes. Um, do we have uh, a count of the students that are in the choice schools and within the SU? Because it seems to me that because um, it goes to what I, my concern is that we need to be able to interpret this. And one way to interpret is those kids that are within our system that we can influence directly. Mm -hmm. The ones in choice schools, and that's going to be one of the questions, how can we uh, influence there and how do we know whether they're doing a good job for our kids? But the, So the first question is, it'd be great if we could somehow in these, gra these mm -hmm. graphs uh, break out um, so that we can see them uh, because as a SU board and district board that's our responsibility everything else but we can't really deal with the Sharon Academy or or Thetford Academy. Well, we, do. We, we do. Can. No, we, we do. We can. We can. We do have some influence. Explain. Sure. So um, so yes. Yes. So um, as I did mention it in the report but it is still our responsibility, even though they don't attend like our building, they no. go to a Sharon Academy or, or a Thetford or somewhere else. Um, we are still responsible um, for their programming via their IEP. Um, so we do have what we call, you know, legal ed education uh, agency. We are that. So we go to their IEP meetings. We go to their evaluation planning meetings. We are part of their students' team, so we hear about how they're being educated and what interventions they're receiving, in, you know, in their schools that they're attending. Um, we do have say in that. We can question them about why they're not doing something or why they're doing something, or to tell us more about if they're in a certain program in their school. Um, we do have influence over that. Yep, we are still part of the team and we are still responsible to make sure that they are getting educated even though they are not um, attending our schools. I, I don't know, I'm somewhat skeptical that we can ur urge, push, uh, report, <laughs> yeah. but to actually get the job done, that takes the leadership of those individual schools mm -hmm. and their staff and their teachers and yeah. their boards. And um, somehow I think we should be aware of their results as well as our results, yeah. not to pick and choose, but mm -hmm. um, that's that's very important. Um, I'm really heartened by the good news that this report shows, and we're showing things that not only are helping kids uh, sooner, 
-hmm. and more effectively, but we're also helping the taxpayers <laughs> because to the extent you do look at that chart showing uh, the, the number of kids that need uh, special help that go outside the mm -hmm. SU, um, I suggest that, I, correct me if I'm wrong, that mm -hmm. cost is substantially more than if we can do it and we are doing it Absolutely. within. So we're helping the kids, mm -hmm. we're helping the taxpayers, um, and we're making a huge difference. And I think that is uh, a message, we're talking about messages that we need to be able to communicate effectively, consistently, mm -hmm. and repeatedly. Mm -hmm. uh, to our constituents. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions for Annette? Hearing none, thank you very much. Yeah, well, real quick, just uh, so the board knows, the uh, central office admin team will be coming to the board. I wanted you to get this report in our social emotional reports that you've been receiving over the last mm -hmm. month. We're going to come to you with some suggestion measures much like how we have academic indicators, the board has asked um, for me to provide some uh, measurable goals uh, in regards to like social emotional. Mm -hmm. So I'll have some draft goals for the board to consider next month. Thank but you. I want you to get all these reports first. So you kind of had some baseline so that when we should come with those goals, that it would make sense mm -hmm. in regards to what we're suggesting. Thank you. Anything else? All right, uh, Tara. Good evening, everyone. You have my report, which outlines our reports that are due in the month of February, and then also the additional projects that I work through um, for all of you throughout the month of February and getting ready for our annual meetings. So if there's any questions, I'll happily answer them. If there are questions in the, the room, I don't see them. So just speak out. <laughs> Any okay. Thank you, Tara. Good work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Ray. Okay. Um, as I uh bring up my report here, I would be happy to uh uh feel any questions or hear any comments uh about anything within the Four corners of that report or my department. If, Bill? Yeah, um, thank heavens I'm not on the IT team and I don't have to be responsible for this, but I just want to point out to my rest of my colleagues that Ray has, uh, I think, uh, gone beyond the normal and, and how many acronyms that he's been using here. We've got APs. <laughs> I thought that was an advanced placement, but it isn't. We've got SSH. I hate to say what I thought that was, like um, add a few uh, letters. Or things. We've got PUTTY with a small U and capital P-T-T-Y. We just need to add PLC. I also have a PUTTY slash SSH um, with the best PD. Okay, so I'm just, I'm not going to even pretend that I understand that. I'm not going to ask you to explain it because it's way over my head, but I just want to ask you, uh, uh, I think we have to expand our educational terminology um, to, to add these new uh, uh, symbols so that we'll have some sense, maybe, if somebody asks us out in the street, what the hell we're doing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, not, not, not the normal level of detail I might put in, but uh, um, definitely something we worked on. And uh, to, be, to be honest, uh important in the department that we are reflecting on our own practice about uh, pd we've had a, a very good year in that area and so uh but beyond that the focus at the moment is on uh vt cap cognitive vt cap and uh the national assessment of education progress that's uh, those are uh coming up next next month so assessments State and national. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Any questions or comments for Ray? More? I think I see a hand. Did, was it? Okay. Uh, policy committee. Eric, do you want to go? Yeah, sure. So, so we considered two policies this evening, um, as we also had, um, uh, 
uh, legal counsel in the meeting. Um, and the long and the short of the conversation is both of the policies that we discussed, which were the drugs and alcohol and the workplace policy and the um, harassment policies, will go back to our attorney for uh, further modifications uh, uh, to consider um, different things, including in the alcohol and drug policy, whether or not uh, it makes sense to have a fitness for duty policy and in the uh, harassment policy to ensure that we are um, compliant, not just with Title VII uh, in the employment arena, but uh, Title IX uh, and all of the different Title IX requirements. Questions or comments? All right, thanks, Eric. Um, discussion. Uh, the uh, uh, WRVSU 2324 goals, board goals, and with possible action on those. Who wants to take those? Um, yeah, um, we started last year with um, not only ha having more robust superintendent goals, which are basically definitions of where we want to take the SU and we want him to lead us in the SU. Uh, but we also started establishing SU board goals. And this is our second year of doing that. And the committee of the three of us, Kathy, Andrew and myself, um, put this together. We think it's important. It helps define why we're here and what we need to do in this next year but we're already well into this next year which is fiscal year 24 so we need this thing to be approved and we need to um, go at it um, and uh, these goals um, are in parallel with the superintendent uh, some people would say well isn't that his goal well no it's our goals most of them because if we don't support the superintendent or the superintendent doesn't take seriously his goals we're going to fall flat in our face. And again, we're a supervisory union and a leadership team that's, that's second to none. Um, at our last meeting, we had the first review of this. Uh, there were particularly a lot of questions that I recall Kathy indicated that over that over the next uh, few weeks, any of you wanted to um, amend this with suggestions, amendments to forward them. And I'm not aware by this document that any of those uh, uh, any suggestions have been made. Um, I think it's to important to understand this is our collective board goals. We're in, in voting yes for this. We're not just sticking it in the drawer. We're saying, hey, we need to do this and we need to be aware of it and keep coming back to that. We don't have much time left. We have until June. Um, but a lot of these things are, most of these things we can do it. Uh, some of these things we've already done it. Um, the budgets obviously are a huge challenge, but we can we can get there. Um, and I was going to suggest we don't decide that tonight, but one way we could um, manage the goals after they're voted would be for Kathy to appoint or people to volunteer uh, to take the lead on any one of these and help um, usher it to a positive conclusion. But we don't have to do that tonight at all. Um, so I'd like to uh, urge. Uh, Sarah, that we get a, a vote on this tonight. Okay. Are there any more discussion or questions um, from any of the board members on it? Eric. I, I didn't work on this, but I'm incredibly grateful for the three of you who worked on this document. I do think it's an important document. And I think that the way that it is written right now, it actually fairly in, uh, encapsulates sort of where, he, where we have been and where we need to be. Um, and I... Um, uh, yeah, I'm just grateful that you folks took this on, uh, you, Bill, especially uh, two years in a row, uh, um, because it is it is an in incredibly important piece of documentation to create cohesiveness in the work that we do. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Thanks, Eric. Would anybody be opposed to do taking action on this now as opposed to waiting to 9.1? So I would entertain a motion to accept 
the WRV SU 2324 board goals. So can I offer an amendment to that? Um, in, rather than accept, it's to adopt. Okay, the, thank you. The goals. Adopt. Thank you. Uh, so, and is that okay with you, Andrew? So, Andrew, we have a. Uh, Andrew, move the motion. Do I have a second? I second. Michael second, and Eric both seconded. Um, any questions or discussions? Um, do you want to do a roll call or do you want to just uh, vote by let's let's do a vote by voice and then see if we need to do a roll call all those in favor say aye 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 aye, aye. 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 any opposed so it unanimously passes thank you to the committee who worked on that um, very much the 22 23 Physical, fiscal audience. <laughs> we don't actually have to take action on this tonight. I just wanted it on here just in case. Um, they're wrapping up the last section of our single audit for BSU. We should have it wrapped up by the end of the week, so it'll be next month. Okay. Great. So, do, any discussion on it, or do you, read, do you want to do that next month? Yeah, it'll be for next month because you haven't seen it yet, so you can't. Can't question it. Where is it? <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. Uh, we will get that out, though, as soon as we have it, to yeah. give you as much time as possible with it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, the electric buses rebate program through EPA update. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Tara and I met um, with the EPA on the Thursday following our last meeting, which the December meeting was actually in January. Uh, we had a productive <laughs> meeting with the EPA um, and STA. Uh, and the good news is, uh, at this moment in time, we got to we got to just finalize with legal. Um, but it looks like they're going to permit us to allow STA to help um, assist with taking the lead in regards to um, implementation of the infrastructure and be able to go out to bid uh, for the electric buses. And so that that's not following on us to have to do that, uh, which would be a huge help for us. And uh, STA does have a, a person who um, their full-time job is those two things, electric uh, buses and the infrastructure. Um, and so that was good news. Uh, we just need to finalize uh, that in regards to the agency of ed uh, and our legal team and uh, we'll come back with a report next month to you guys about that but i'm feeling as optimistic as i have in the last six that uh, we could be actually be coming to a place where we're going to really come to you uh, with an update in regards to the actual proposal to make two things happen patrick can i get you to mute your uh um, your microphone. Thank you. Thanks. Um, um, so that was good news because uh, having some assistance with folks that have experience in this in this domain um, and who has worked directly with the EPMA on this before, they will be the folks operating these vehicles. They are also the folks that have to dispose. Remember, part of this rebate grant was we needed to have three buses disposed of. We don't own buses. So we need STA to dispose of the buses and make certain all that paperwork filled out. So not having that be the in-between of some of that will make this a lot less um, complicated. Amy? I thought last time we met, we were discussing the cost of the infrastructure. Uh, where are we with that? We're going to have to go back out to bid, Amy, but STA would actually be the one going out to bid. Okay. Yeah, we wouldn't have to. And Will? Yeah. So what? I mean, what do you think the timeline is now with this? If we, you know, if we get them on board to go out to bid, um, you know, within the next two three months, like when are we actually going to get buses? I think it's still the timeline would be next fall. Okay. Yeah, which is what we've been shooting for. Um, even if it was us, I would actually say I think this will speed it up possibly. Um, 
So that's that's our hope. Other questions or comments? Oh, and the other thing to know by the pass through, the nice thing for us too is because this was a rebate program that that pass through goes directly to STA. So we are not um, in the place of having to pay out for these things. Like you asked the question, Amy, and then wait to get reimbursed by the EPA. That would then become part of STA's responsibility uh, through the pass through, that they will be the ones laying out the funds to build the infrastructure. Um, and then they'll get reimbursed directly from the EPA, not us. Great. Questions or comments? So did I miss, mess any of that up? I You've I... got it all spot on. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, we've taken care of nine then. Uh, so public comment. I don't think we have public on here. So we'll move along to uh, resignations and new hires. I look at Annette because that's <laughs> it's special ed that yeah, we really honey. employ, but no, we don't have any. Okay, great. Uh, any other business to bring before us tonight? Yeah, well, it I seems just, like. Sorry, I, I, just say that, I just wanted to say that it's great to see Patrick's commitment to being in on this telephone call with this kiddo asleep on his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Support that father, right on, man. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Thank that, you. That, that dovetails, dovetails with the comment I was going to make, Michael, which is um, that that we do have a resignation, and appears like Patrick's son, or, or sorry, child, <laughs> I can't tell from here, has resigned from this meeting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Thank you both. Um, anything else? Does anybody have any future agenda items that we um, need to put on? I would like us to, to um, I don't know if it's a, a board or just to be on our radar, just that uh, working across districts to support each other's budgets and come up with talking points and all of that <laughs> would be helpful. And, and I just like to encourage us to do that. Um, I don't know if that's at a, that's my dog out there barking. I don't know if that's a, uh, an, an agenda item or what, but. No, no, I think we could capture that, Sarah, um, especially because it will be, it'll be leading up to the annual meetings. Uh, the other things just to remind the board is we'll have the audit. And then we also, you'll be receiving um, a February academic data report. Andrew? Um, so one word at some representation model that we have of three people per district was put in place kind of before all the mergers in our SU. And so after the mergers, it wound up where, you know, the towns that didn't merge still have the same number, but the towns that did merge wound up with basically half the representation. So I think that's something we should look at as a board and try and come up with something for what makes sense now that kind of in our new configuration. Um, so so um, what the agenda Andrew, item? Andrew, I think what you're asking for is actually a discussion item on a law that was passed last year. So it has nothing okay, to yeah. do actually with districts that merged or didn't. It has to do actually with population um, in regards to districts. Okay. Uh, within that statute. So I think it is, is worth the full board taking up under discussion. And certainly I can offer the board my thoughts around that and what I think the pros or cons may be. Okay, so we'll put that on as an agenda item. Thank you, Andrew. Other thoughts? I, I just have a quick question for Jamie because you sit in on all of our, um, our board meetings and uh, you just had the pleasure, Jamie, of being on, on one earlier. I, I was wondering about having a conversation at some point about how boards respond to um, community comment or feedback or input that is, uh, oh, what's the best way of putting it, Jamie or Will? Challenging? Um, Less than desirable. Well, I mean, everybody is welcome. It's just when people get particularly challenging. I, I would just love some guidance on what people do and some thoughts on that. Or some yeah, brainstorming yeah. on it too. Just yep. bring that up. 
And also, I would say, Michael, you know, when they ask questions, right? Yeah. And they're not comments, and it becomes right. a conversation. <laughs> well, and, 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 and when people say things that are veiled threats. Well, that, we dude. did at one point in our agenda do a, have a uh, like board training part. Um, I know the VSBA did it, but I also think that we have people who have facilitated and done, you know, that, that so we could brainstorm that and maybe put a, um, you know, part back in there where we could help each other um, in our our board work. So. Yeah, what what I think what I what comes to my mind is. Um, really you know possibly as a as a full board committing to some type of like uh procedure and protocols in regards to how we would handle like public comment and participation through meetings yep patrick yeah um <clears throat> bill and amy might recall the conversation we had uh about this particular topic yes. and i think Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what we were saying is if we get addressed, say, out in public with a tough question, that we just simply suggest that they come to the next board meeting, <laughs> uh, attend it as, you know, as a public and have public comment at, at the next meeting and discuss this it. Is, so this the board, is at, at, at actual meetings, Patrick. With at the, meetings. At being okay. Better. Understood. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, let's. Uh, we'll work on that on the agenda of putting a, a, that into our agenda. Any other agenda items? All right. Those are some good ideas. Thank you all. Um, our next meeting is February 27th at 6 o'clock. And I would take a motion to adjourn. So move. So move. And a second. Second. Yeah. And I'll see you all, if not before, on the 27th. Have a good month. See ya. Bye-bye. Get, get, get to bed. <laughs>